Hello, welcome to a new episode of Hardy Wrestling with me, Stephanie Hardy. If you're listening, thank you for listening to all of my episodes so far if you have. And if you have not and is your first one, welcome. I am recording live from my dining room and I am watching um, the WrestleMania replay that they're doing of WrestleMania 32 from Texas in 2016. And it's just giving me all the feels right now because it's officially WrestleMania week. And there's so much to discuss um, that's happened um, this past week in wrestling. So thank you for listening to me. And we're going to start with news and gossip And then we're going to go to a pretty, um, I don't want to say dark, but a pretty um, kind of somber wrestling fan story time and then we're going to go into everything that happened this week in wrestling so here again welcome to hardy wrestling Okay, so we're going to start with news and gossip-ish for this week. So we're going to start with the report that Roman Reigns may be out of WrestleMania due to health concerns. So you know how they've been advertising for him to be fight to fight Goldberg for the Universal title at WrestleMania this week, this coming weekend? Well, it's looking like that might be um, put on ice for now because um, he felt he didn't really Roman Reigns didn't feel comfortable doing any more of the performance center shows during the crisis because he is immunocompromised from his leukemia battle and he didn't want to risk his health and wwe did honor his request but there is no word on who will possibly replace him now like i said this is a report and since this is um gossip ish i just want to point out that during this time they have yet to announce who is supposed to take his place i know this um week when they were advertising WrestleMania and even down to today as they're showing WrestleMania 32 and they're showing commercials, they have been advertising Roman Reigns and Goldberg as if it's still supposed to happen. So like I said, that's just a report. But at the same point in rate, he wasn't on SmackDown either this past week. So it's just kind of up in the air right now. But I'm really glad that the company was able to give him permission to sort of you know, make his health the number one concern because, I mean, this is a situation that sort of compromised a lot of people and I know they don't want to put in danger his life in any or his family's life in any way shape or form so we're wishing the best for him regardless of what he chooses to do of course I would love to see him fight Goldberg this um, weekend but if he can't then I completely get that so there's that but you know I'll keep you up to date on that And then next on the agenda, we have the idea that every NXT TakeOver Tampa match that was that was canceled due to the crisis will take place on NXT TV on USA starting this Wednesday. So this was first reported by Sports Illustrated beginning this Wednesday, which is April 1st. Each match that was set to take place at NXT TakeOver Tampa will be on USA because, as you know, with the event that was scheduled, um, which was NXT TakeOver Tampa, they would have that probably, I believe, the Saturday before WrestleMania. But, of course, all of the events, including the Hall of Fame, have been postponed due to the crisis. So every match that was set to take place on that pay-per-view the Saturday before will now be moved to television. Now, this isn't so much as a big deal because of the fact that every match that they put on NXT television is basically stellar quality on the same level as the takeovers. So I'm not necessarily mad about that. Now, some of these matches will include the number one contenders ladder match for the NXT Women's Championship to face either Rhea Ripley or Charlotte Flair, whoever wins their match this weekend. And um, Johnny Gargano versus Tommaso Ciampa will take place in an empty building somewhere in two weeks, which was mandated by Triple H. And maybe it looks as if they were setting up Adam Cole versus the Velveteen Dream for the NXT Championship. And definitely now Keith Lee versus Damian Priest versus Dominic Dijakovic for the NXT North American Championship. So this is not a surprising move by them, but I'm really glad that, you know, they're taking advantage of the idea of doing it on free television as opposed to making a sort of have to pay for it during the week of mania but that's where we are now so that's going to be good and next on the docket we have dark side of the ring and how that premiered on this past tuesday on the vice network if you have that if your cable um company carries that so this and every tuesday um vice the vice network will be 
showing their second season of the hit documentary series Dark Side of the Ring. It discusses some of wrestling's urban legends and saddest stories. And this past week, they came in they came in very hot with the two-part Chris Benoit tragedy episode. And I'm going to talk about that more in story time. So if um, you care to check that out, it is also available on Vice's YouTube page and on Vice.com. They put the first part of the episode on YouTube first, but then they put the second part on there after the whole thing um, aired this past Tuesday. And if, you know, you were watching the news during the year of 2007, during the summer, I'm pretty sure you heard about this tragedy, but I'll talk more about that in my story time. And also on the agenda, or last on the agenda, I must say, Netflix is going to release two WWE-themed features, and which is basically in the form of a TV show and a feature film. The first, first we have The Big Show Show, which is an original comedy series starring Paul White, aka The Big Show, and it'll show him dealing with the ups and downs of raising three daughters with a wife after his retirement from the ring. And it looks really cute and really funny if you're into family comedies, kind of like Family Matters or um, something like that, or like, or Eight Simple Rules or something like that. And it also stars Jaleel White from Family Matters, who um, starred as Steve Urkel. And it premieres the Monday after WrestleMania. So basically this coming weekend and the Monday afterward, that's when it premieres on Netflix. And then we also have the original movie called The Main Event, which involves a, the story of an 11-year-old boy named Leo Thompson, who dreams of being a WWE superstar. But he kind of deals with bullies along the way because, you know, don't all kids deal with that? And they really don't, you know understand why he loves wrestling or whatever and he's misunderstood at school but then he gets thrust into the world of wrestling when he finds a magical lucha style mask that endows him with amazing athletic abilities so if this sounds familiar it sounds kind of like 2002's like mike with little bow wow at the time when he found michael jordan sneakers and put them on and then he became endowed with basketball abilities and he was playing basketball with the likes of Vince Carter and um, Allen Iverson and so many different people who were, you know, basketball who's who back then. And it also, and basically it sounds like a cool story. It's something you can watch with your children. It's a really kid friendly type story. And it also stars um, Seth Carr as Leo, the little boy, the iconic Tashina Arnold, who is Pam from Martin and WWE superstars, um, SmackDown tag champ, The Miz, Kofi Kingston, commentator, Corey Graves, Seamus, Otis from the tag team Heavy Machinery, and NXT North American champion Keith Lee. So it looks really cute and really silly if you're into um, kid-friendly movies like that. Um, but even if you're not, I would just encourage you to give it a chance. It's really cool that it's premiering um, after WrestleMania and stuff because it's a very high-profile event in which they use media to sort of put forth a lot of new things that they're going to start. So it's going to be really cool. So now that we're finished with that, we're going to go into wrestling fan story time. All right, so in this segment of wrestling fan story time, I'm going to discuss something that's going to get really sad to a certain degree but actually not even to a certain degree but just really sad and I know that a lot of the time um since I've started this podcast I sort of talk about the things about wrestling that make me incredibly happy as a wrestling fan because it's something I've watched since I was a child and I and it still gives me joy to this day but I have but I can't be the budding wrestling journalist I am without being able to tell the truth about it Um, about some of its darker sides and it's tough because something that you love so much of course has its darker moments as does life so what I'm going to discuss is going to be kind of difficult but hopefully you can listen to it but if you can't listen to it anymore I completely understand it because it's tough to have to stomach but at the same time if you can listen to it more power to you but if you can't that's more power to you as well I do not blame you one bit so what I'm going to discuss is the subject of dark side of the ring and like I said in the news segment they started their second season 
this past Tuesday, and it started with the two-part, two-hour episode about the Chris Benoit tragedy. Now, this happened when I was 14 years old, I believe, 13 or 14 years old, and this was in 2007, and if you hadn't heard anything about it, or if you had heard about it or forgotten about it, this is what happened. They on the documentary, they discussed um, how this wrestler named Chris Benoit, who was very acclaimed all over the world for his technical wrestling ability, um, and he was seen as generally a nice guy in the locker room, very serious um, competitor who took his craft very seriously, um, which is something that they touched on in this documentary. Um, Mysteriously, he... One weekend during, I believe during the summer, he lived, he lived in Atlanta, in the Atlanta area, and he killed his wife and killed his child and then killed himself afterward within the span of three days. And it was all over the news. It was tough for me to sort of um, process in that area because I didn't find out on the news. I was at my grandmother's house at the time and I found out as Monday Night Raw was starting to broadcast it that that day. They announced that Chris Benoit and his family had died. And in my young mind, I thought, well, how did this happen? This seems like it could have been like an accident. In my mind, I'm thinking, well, maybe it was an accident. Maybe someone, you know, robbed them. And maybe it was just, you know, just something random that just happened. Like it was, I mean, it was random. But I thought it wasn't anything detrimental like it turned out to be. And they had showed on Monday Night Raw, they had all these wrestlers, you know, do this sort of montage that they do where all the wrestlers sort of get together and talk about the person, you know, who's passed and the family that's passed and everything, paying tribute to them, showing all their best matches, showing all their best moments and all of the above. They do that. Um, they did that back then. They don't do that that much now when a wrestler passes. When they, when a wrestler passes, they show like a full on like video um, montage, and then that's it. Because and they go on with the rest of the show, unless the person um, was still working for the company or something, and it's huge. And then they do a whole tribute. But um, that's what they did for him back then. And then it left me kind of disturbed because I'm just like. In my mind, I don't know anything that's going on. So I'm just like, bro, like who would come in their house and do something like that to them? Or what happened to them that would make them, you know, just all die all at once. But the next day, Tuesday happened. And when I woke up, they were saying that they were investigating it as a murder-suicide, which destroyed me because I'm just like, what? And the things that they were saying... They were saying that Chris Benoit was the one who facilitated it, that he was the one who killed the wife and the child, killed Nancy and Daniel, and then killed himself. And I was reeling because I'm just like, this dude didn't seem like the type of dude that would do something like this. I'm upset. And then I watched wrestling that Tuesday. They would show WWE's version of ECW at the time, and Vince McMahon was saying, given light of everything that's happened and what's went on we're not going to mention him anymore like ever and they kept that promise because in WWE to this day they barely mention him the only mention that I've seen of him um is the fact that of course they have um all kinds of archived stuff on the WWE network where he wrestled and then they also have they also put him in their edition of the encyclopedia of sports entertainment that I currently own and they talked about his wrestling ability and what he did in terms of championships but they didn't talk about him anymore after that but at the same point and rate on television they do not discuss him ever and they don't sell his merchandise like you just don't find him anywhere and it was just something that you just I guess in my young mind I had to recover from on my own and just sort of heal from because what can you do? You're a child and you're sort of left with, you know, all these questions wondering why he, why this man that you've watched on television for so long would just up and do something like this. You know, I was just confused. And then the older I got, the more 
and the more um, information I would grow to learn about wrestling behind the scenes and the more I started participating with wrestling fans online the more I started to realize there are people who feel half and half about it and when I say half and half I mean there are people who feel like WWE was totally in the right to not mention him anymore because of the actions of it you know and because they felt because they still feel raw about it to this day and you also have your other half of wrestling fans this is no disrespect to them but you have your other half of wrestling fans who feel like even in spite of all that he did that he should still be recognized by the WWE and still put in the Hall of Fame and let me be clear about this in my adult mind I do not feel at, in terms of me being 26 years old now I do not feel that WWE should ever put him in the Hall of Fame simply because of the fact that even though he may not have been in his right mind which they discussed on the documentary that he was suffering with CTE and he had the mind of an 86 year old man and he may not have been completely in his right mind when he did this stuff it's just the fact that this is a publicly traded company and it's just they'll never do anything like that because if they induct someone who deliberately murdered his family and then also killed himself from not wanting to face the consequences of that that would destroy them all over again and when I say all over again I mean there's the idea that when this first happened the media went on a witch hunt for the wrestling business there was so much it was like they were ready to destroy the wrestling business and everything as a whole I remember watching interviews they did on CNN with John Cena and Chris Jericho where they accused them of having taken steroids because they blamed it on roid rage they dissed wrestling and used all kinds of you know wrestlers who had died in the past and basically said oh if you're a wrestler you're bound to die early and all this other stuff like people barely respect wrestling enough as it is because they feel like oh it's a fake sport and there's you know it doesn't have as much you know athleticism as every other sport that they consider to be real which is far which is the furthest thing from the truth so with that aspect of it they were just destroying wrestling as a whole and it is a miracle that in 2007 they were able to even rehab their image and be able to still function because of the actions of Chris Benoit and it was just horrible to have to sit there and watch these people talk terrible about what you love and what you enjoy in that manner but that's what happened and it was tough and so with that in mind as an adult now I don't feel like they should induct him into the Hall of Fame but in the documentary they were discussing how they feel like Nancy Benoit should be acknowledged which is true because she and her son were very innocent in all of this they were abused to the point of death but at the same point in rate Nancy also had her own very own career in wrestling as well she may not have been a wrestler but she you know was a valet and she knew a lot about the wrestling business because she had been married to a wrestler by the name of Kevin Sullivan as well and everything she did in terms of her character work as woman um as Kevin Sullivan's valet or whatever was very valid she knew a lot about the wrestling business she loved it so if you want to acknowledge her then go ahead if you want to acknowledge her son please go ahead because they were innocent in all of this but Chris Benoit definitely not um and something else that they discussed in the documentary was the fact that um was the fact that WWE's response to it in terms of injuries it's like at first they discussed how back in the day if you got a concussion or if you were hit with chairs which is something that they do a lot even now but back then they were a little less careless in terms of they were very careless in how they would hit you with a chair. They would just hit you across the head and you would just have to take it. It was almost like a rite of passage. Whereas now they safely hit you in a manner um, in which it doesn't hurt you or give you head injuries that will cause you, you know, to have irreparable damage to your brain for the rest of your life. 
And when it comes to the wellness policy, they had implemented a wellness policy after Eddie Guerrero had passed away. But honestly, the um, it wasn't as it wasn't enforced as heavy as heavily as it is now. And I can say that WWE has truly, you know, made the right improvements to help their wrestlers sort of have good health um, going forward even now. But even when they discussed um, Eddie Guerrero's death and how that had an effect on Chris Benoit, it was hard because when Eddie passed, that was really sad as well. But at the same point in rate, it affected Chris Benoit's mental and emotional health because that was his brother. That was his wrestling brother in arms. They came up together and they won championships together. Like they loved each other. And when Eddie passed, it broke something in Chris. And that's not to justify anything he did, but at the same point in rate, when you're under emotional stress like that and you keep crying, and then also coupled with the fact that your brain isn't necessarily working as well as it should be, it just doesn't work. So... This is all I have to say about the subject. Um, This is all I have to say about the subject because I could not address it. But I will say this. I just hope and pray that in the wrestling business, this never happens again. I hope and pray that no other wrestler going forward will have to deal with CTE issues. And I hope and pray that nobody ever gets pushed to such a dark turn in life so um that's my wrestling fan story time and I'm sorry it was very bleak or whatever but I had to discuss it um I just hope and pray that you're all taking care of yourselves and that you're living a living a good life and don't let anybody push you to the point to where you feel like there's no return and with that we're going to go to the next segment All right, so if you're still with me, thank you for staying. Um, now we've gone to this to this segment called This Week in Wrestling. So now what we're going to discuss is Monday Night Raw. And we're going to start with our girls, with the women. So, Shayna Baszler had an interview with Charlie Caruso. And they were sitting in a single spotlight in the middle of the ring at the Performance Center. And she was glaring at Charlie and she was saying, are you nerd? She was like, you look nervous, Charlie. You think I'm going to bite you? And she and once Charlie kept asking her questions, she said that Becky should expect to lose her the match at WrestleMania. And she stated that she wants the title because she loves to destroy. She said from the very beginning, I've shown everyone exactly who I was. But as she was getting into it, Becky attacked Shayna from behind with a chair and she left in pretty amazing fashion. And then they did, and also in terms of women, they did a replay of Charlotte Flair and Asuka's match for the SmackDown Women's Championship at WrestleMania 34 in New Orleans in 2018. Um, this This was when Asuka won the Royal Rumble that year, the first Women's Royal Rumble at that. And as she won... Um, she had a championship match and she chose to face Charlotte of course back then Charlotte won that match and when they replayed it I didn't like how they didn't show how Oscar was gracious about it and hugged Charlotte and said congratulations they just cut that part off and then they went back to the present day showing um, Charlotte interview Charlie and Charlie asked her how she felt about looking back at that match and Charlotte said it was inspiring to look back and she was assuming that Rhea Ripley is excited about defending the NXT Women's Championship and making history in that aspect because this will be the first time the NXT Women's Championship will be defended at WrestleMania. And she told Charlie that if Rhea Ripley wanted a history lesson, she can look back at all of her WrestleMania moments. She retired the Divas Championship in Texas in 2016 to become the first ever WWE Women's Champion or Raw Women's Champion, if you you know will. And one of the, and she was one of the first women to main event WrestleMania last year with um, Ronda Rousey and Becky Lynch, and as they fought for the winner take all for both Raw and SmackDown Women's titles. Mind you, she didn't come out victorious, but you know, 
you get the point history was made <laughs> so that's really all that happened with the women on raw so now we're gonna go to the men the show started with the paul Heyman drew mcintyre montage from um two weeks ago and then paul Heyman and brock lesnar were standing in the middle of the ring and paul Heyman started talking and saying that we lived that we live rather in most uncertain times he said we all need a little certainty and i give you that in brock lesnar lesnar can do what he wants but drew cannot beat lesnar he also said that drew can get down on his knees and pray all he wants to but god's prayer line will give a busy signal and i thought that was really funny because i'm just like first of all my god <laughs> but anyway um <laughs> um the the christian in me kind of came out i'm sorry y'all um drew put lesnar on his back multiple times <laughs> But when he said when WrestleMania is over, Drew McIntyre will be another B word that tried and Brock Lesnar will be the champ then, now and forever. Then they showed a replay of John Cena versus Seth Rollins versus Brock Lesnar from the 2015 Royal Rumble to sort of solidify, you know, Brock Lesnar's dominance. And I'm going to talk about some of the things that I liked in the match because I won't, you know, go through the play by play like I normally do for every other match that happens in the present day. So I'm going to mention that during this 2015 Royal Rumble match, I liked how Seth's theme did not have burn it down in it and how people were chanting or singing John Cena sucks, John Cena sucks. And then I also liked how they showed match highlights. Um on the titan tron whenever theme songs would play which is something that they really don't do anymore um and that's something that my boyfriend noticed when we were watching it together and seth was mr money in the bank with j and j security back then and then a really funny quote that my boyfriend said um when they were showing the replay of the match he said hey wwe immortals that doesn't exist anymore and i thought that was funny because you know, WWE has random cell phone games that they like to push out every now and again. And Immortals was one of them. And he was really excited about it, but it doesn't exist anymore. So there. Um, and then they also did a recap and back to the present day. They did a recap of AJ Styles and Undertaker's beef. AJ Styles had a promo. He called the match the phenomenal one versus the phenom and how they're going to go one on one. But he stated that the Undertaker has no control because of Michelle McCool and called him a gothic version of Dog the Bounty Hunter and the Tiger King. Now, mind you, by at Monday, at the time of this came on on Monday, I had no clue what the Tiger King was. Now I do. I have a general idea. I'm not going to watch it. But anyway, um, he made fun of a tiger saving video that The Undertaker did with Michelle because one of Michelle's um, things that she likes to um, be one of the things that she likes to support is basically animal rights and i guess they did like a promo video saying you could save the tigers by doing this this and a third you know one of those videos and aj styles mentioned ever since he lost to brock lesnar he has lost his mystique and you post and he posts on instagram and he wants to take and he wants the undertaker from yesteryear in the match and he stated that he challenged that he's going to challenge the undertaker to a boneyard match and he said, within the Boneyard match, I'm going to bury you in the perfect plot that Michelle picked out when she buried your career. And that was really ouch. Um, I kind of don't like how he's just consistently throwing shade at Michelle. But maybe this is going to tap into a part of Undertaker we've never seen. But then again, it just feels really awkward for you to be throwing shade at Michelle because they legit got married when Michelle was like not even working for the company anymore so it's just kind of awkward but whatever float your boat <laughs> so then they announced that the Street Profits were going to be fighting were going to be defending their Raw Tag Team Championships against Andrade and Angel Garza at Wrestlemania and they did a promo and Zelina Vega um, both their managers said that they will show why they are a good team and then Andrade stated the street prophets want the smoke but we want the titles and then angel garza said we are both men who know what they want with a wink at charlie and then my boyfriend said that angel garza is doing to charlie what the rock used to do with lillian garcia so if you had ever watched wrestling in the past 
you know that The Rock, whenever he would get interviewed by Lillian Garcia, who is like an who was like an amazing ring announcer back in the day, um, she was also a backstage um, interviewer. And anytime she would interview The Rock, she would just smile at him over and over again. She thought he was really handsome. I don't know if this was a character or if this was real, but she would kind of like he would kind of flirt with her. And it would just be really funny to kind of watch because he would kind of like scold her for it. But at the same time, you could tell he was schmoozing her with it or whatever. And it's a nice callback to the past because Angel Garza basically does the same thing to Charlie because Charlie gets all bothered like, ooh, it's Angel. But, you know, Angel's handsome, but, you know it's okay um and then they did a recap of edge's promo from two weeks ago and then they had a match um with andrade and angel guards with zelina vega versus cedric alexander and ricochet who have been sort of on a slump lately with their losses but in this match they didn't have a slump at all so um, Andrade and Angel attacked Ricochet because he did his entrance first, but then Cedric ran out to his defense and the match started and it was very physical. Um, Garza pulled the tag rope from the turnbuckle and he distracted the referee and then took advantage and then the Street Profits came out to do commentary um, for it. And this is another moment in which my boyfriend said Angel Garza could be the next Eddie Guerrero. He has his charisma. So my boyfriend was just doing a lot of quotables um, Monday. It was great. Um, then Garza, um, was just being awesome with his kicks and slaps, but then Cedric was showing off his fire cruiserweight off offense and Angel and and Andrade, you know, ultimately won the match after a botched count, but ultimately it made me happy to see Cedric and, um, Ricochet sort of show off their athleticism and show why, you know, they shouldn't be just kept off television or why they shouldn't just be putting nothing matches all the time or why they shouldn't just be stuffed onto main event on the WWE network all the time. But something else that my boyfriend said is that he feels like Rick outside of pure athleticism, he feels like Cedric Alexander and Ricochet really don't have a whole lot of um, personality to bring in terms of, you know, characters. So hopefully they'll be able to turn all that around and then become the stars that they're meant to be. And then the Street Profits um, got into it with Angel and Andrade, but then they didn't fight each other because the Street Profits had a match with Shane Thorne and um, I forgot the man, the man's name. It was Shane Thorne and Brendan Vick. There we go. And Brendan Vick. And they wound up putting up some good offense, but ultimately they wound up losing because the Street Profits, have, of course, have to move forward um, and gain momentum towards WrestleMania this weekend. So, yeah. Then... We had our truth and how he won back his 24-7 championship from Riddick Moss um, outside while Riddick Moss was jogging somewhere. And then he actually told Riddick Moss to go back to playing football and called him Randy Moss. Now, this is hilarious because everybody knows Randy Moss is black. But <laughs> but our truth is just so zany that anybody who has like a last name that's similar to his, he just blurts it out and he's just goofy. And then they announced that, of course, ESPN was showing WrestleMania 32 from Texas, and they're doing that tonight. And then there was a match between Aleister Black and Leon Ruff, who was a jobber. And for those who don't know what a jobber is, that's a person who um, who they basically hire on to enhance their talent that they have hired on full time. And they basically fight in a match that doesn't necessarily last as long to sort of make the superstar look stronger. So that's a jobber. Um, Leon Ruff seriously look scared um but then as Aleister Black said crisscross applesauce Ruff started attacking him but then he met a black mass and then Aleister Black won and then another quotable moment for my boyfriend he said the silence really helped this match it added to the awkwardness <laughs> and then Kevin Owens had a promo he said Seth last week I was here to answer your challenge but you were nowhere to be found and Seth actually came out by himself without his disciples, Buddy Murphy and the AOP. He said, this place is pretty nice in reference to the performance center. And then he said, do you honestly believe fighting me in this building gives you the home advantage? Um, Seth was talking about how when he started in the WWE, 
he came from the independent circuit but when he started in the wwe he trained in the old fcw headquarters which is more like this small um warehouse building so he didn't get to reap the benefits of a performance center so he really you know kind of just dissed it a little bit and he said seth didn't train Seth said, I didn't train in this building because it was built on my sacrifice. He said he walked into a dilapidated warehouse, FCW, like I said. He said he had to suffer and persevere and succeed for people like you. So you can get an opportunity to train in a place like this. And he said that NXT doesn't exist without Seth Rollins. He said there is no Johnny Gargano. There is no Tommaso Ciampa. No Undisputed Era. No NXT TakeOver or no women's evolution without Seth Rollins. And that made me real upset because I'm sitting here like, first of all, how are you going to sit here and take credit for the women's evolution existing when in actuality, if it really wasn't for Paige and Emma, the women's evolution wouldn't exist. And by extension, women like the fabulous Moolah, technically, and Mae Young and all the other pioneers of women's wrestling. Don't take credit for our stuff. Anyway, um, he talked about his record at WrestleMania and how he beat Triple H and how he beat Brock Lesnar and how Owen's WrestleMania record screams failure. And he said, under pressure, I become a God, lowercase. You really don't stand a chance. So that was a very good promo. And then we had the Randy Orton promo, which ended the show. He said, over the last few months, I've done some things out of love to, um, and then he said that he needed to apologize to Edge and he said, I lied to your wife when I said that you were a junkie for the crowd. He said, you're a junkie for Edge, the character. And he basically called him by his government name, which is Adam Copeland. He said, I was handed an opportunity because of my last name. He was basically embracing the fact that his father and grandfather were both famous wrestlers before he was. And he said that I see the Intercontinental Championship and the World Heavyweight Championship wasn't just handed to him, though. He took the torch from Mick Foley after spitting in his face, which is totally gross. I don't recommend you watch that. It will make you mad. Um, he says, I have the one thing that you said I didn't have, which is grit. He said, grit to me is longevity in a business that rarely has any. Nobody has as much grit as me, and you call me an entitled brat. If Triple H asked you to join Evolution, would you have said no? I sent Lyric and Ruby's father back home because I love you. Edge, you may be writing the story, but I'm going to write the last chapter and end it. I accept your challenge. And then the show ended with Randy Orton staring a hole into the camera. So this Randy Orton Edge match, which is going to be a last man standing match, is going to be very interesting. So now we're going to talk about NXT. All right, so we're going to start with NXT, which took place at Full Sail University, and we're going to talk about the women. So both of these matches were to set up the ladder match for the number one contendership for the NXT Women's Championship. The first women's match was between Io Shirai and Aaliyah. Aaliyah was supposed to face Mia, um, not Mia Yim, but Zia Lee. But Zia Lee got beat up backstage and got attacked by a mystery person. So Io Shirai had to take her place. Io wound up winning the match in short order with a moonsault, so now she qualifies for the ladder match. And I feel so sorry for Aaliyah. I feel like she's been repackaged over and over again, but yet nothing seems to work with her. So I feel sorry for her. And then we had um, a match between Candice LeRae, aka Candice Wrestling, and Caden Carter. Now, this started with a traditional lockup, with, and it was a very fast-paced match that didn't have too many impressive spots in it, but Candice LeRae wound up um, victorious in the match, and now she qualified for the ladder match um, as well. And then it was announced later on um, that this coming Wednesday, there will be a last chance match for the final spot in the ladder match between Dakota Kai, Shotzi Blackheart, Aaliyah, Kaden Carter, Deanna Parasso, and Zia Lee, who was attacked earlier in the night. So we get to look forward to that. And that's all that happened with the women. So now we're going to go straight to the men. Now the show started with Austin Theory versus Tyler Breeze. And it stemmed from their confrontation three weeks ago um, where Tyler Breeze called him a flash in the pan. So it started with two sets of lockups. Then Austin Theory called Breeze the past and said that he was the future. 
Then um, Tyler Breeze hit him with a supermodel drop kick, but then Austin took advantage. Then he put his knee in Tyler Breeze's back while in a headlock, but then Tyler Breeze broke broke away from the headlock and hit a jawbreaker, but then Theory hit a drop kick and knocked Breeze out of the ring. Tyler Breeze then got slammed through the barricade, but then he bounces back with a knee. And then Austin Theory kept taking advantage of the match and then he hit a backbreaker to a near fall. Austin Theory took the phone from the from the ring and was all and he was talking trash and you know talking about how he was the best and whatever. But then he got distracted when he was getting ready to hit his finisher and then Tyler Breeze hit the beauty shot for the win. So that was pretty interesting and I don't know if that feud's going to still go on. We'll see. Then we had Killian Dane versus Tahuti Miles who is a newcomer to NXT. He served in the U.S. Army in Afghanistan. He had great agility throughout the match. He kept kicking Killian Dane, and of course, Killian Dane was kicking back. And um, there was a point where Killian Dane slammed Miles into some stairs, but then he kept stomping um, to Hootie Miles as well. And Miles kept trying to fight back, but then Killian Dane was just too powerful, and he hit the Vader bomb on him for the win. So, welcome to Hootie Miles to NXT. Then we had a match between Cameron Grimes and Tony Nese. Tony Nese is still dissing people who doesn't have abs like him. He's a former Cruiserweight champion, if you don't know who he is, because he mainly hangs out on 205 Live on Fridays. And there was a point where Cameron Grimes hit a grungy headlock on um, Tony Nese, and it was very painful looking, but it also looked kind of sloppy too, so I mean, it's whatever. Take what you will from that. Um, Then there was a incredibly hurtful arm lock and then a knee um from Tony Nice but then Cameron Grimes put Nice in an arm lock um to respond to that and he kept grinding his hand in Nice's ears. Tony Nice then kicked Cameron Grimes in the face and then there was a huge highlight where Tony Nice hit a springboard moonsault. But then of course Cameron Grimes hit his hit two Superman forearms to respond to Nice's super kick and then he hit the Cayman the Cayman double stop for the win. So now Cameron Grimes is still on a roll even though he's a little bit sloppy but well hopefully he'll get better then there was a Keith Lee promo and he wanted to issue an apologize to his one true person Dominic Dijakovic for attacking him two weeks ago but um Dominic didn't want to hear it and he challenged him to a match for the NXT North American title again and then Damian Priest came out and interrupted them and also issued a challenge for the title as well but it all came down to a major brawl between all of them and Damian Priest came out standing tall after it was all over so now those three are going to fight on NXT TV at some point because they were supposed to fight in TakeOver and then there was a match between Danny Burch and Oni Lorcan it's a tag team match versus Shane Thorne and Brendan Vick and these two fought Monday on Raw against the Street Profits and lost and this was a standard NXT tag match and then it was notable how um, Thorne and Vic lost two matches this week with the first one being against Street Profits on Raw and then there's this one I hope pretty soon they can turn it around so there was that and then there was Matt Riddle versus Roderick Strong and then Matt kept paying tribute to the fans who would be chanting bro and he was singing bro along with the song and it was kind of sad but it's okay um (laughs) we'll be back at some point and then there was a and then there was a point where there was a gut wrench suplex by um roger strong who can probably do some of the best suplexes in the whole business then matt riddle won the match after hitting the bro Derek, but was attacked by a new middle eastern or samoan tag team that's managed by this guy named My- malcolm bivens who called them the future of the nxc tag team division so this is a very interesting dynamic because when it comes to the tag team championships it's either you have of course the tag team championships are now held by Matt Riddle and um, Pete Dunn the broser weights but it seems like it's always the undisputed era going after the titles all the time because they're you know they think they're the thoroughbred four horsemen type people whatever but it's nice to see new tag teams sort of um staking their claim so that was cool to see hopefully they'll get a name soon and then to end the show, Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Gargano confronted each other with Triple H. Papa Hunter t- 
told them that there would be no physicality tonight and that they would fight again and finally end this feud because it's spilling all over the place now. They're fighting all over the performance center, breaking things, all of the above. They've been fighting for almost a, like two years now, so it's getting out of hand. Now, Johnny Gargano refused to have the match take place at WrestleMania because that's too much like right. Um, so Triple H decided to have the match in one week in an empty building, but then they were interrupted by an apocalyptic video package announcing the arrival of a mystery person. So that was the end of the show. And now we're going to move on to SmackDown. Right, so we're gonna go to SmackDown, and the show basically started with the women. Um, it started with Sasha Banks and SmackDown Women's Champion Bailey with a fresh new haircut. Um, and Sasha stated that basically WrestleMania is a magical night where all dreams are possible. But they were they talked about how they were mad at Paige for putting them in a match against each other in the um, six pack challenge, and. Basically, they said that it wasn't fair and that their plan will backfire. And as Sasha looked doubtful that Bailey was saying that they were going to, you know, come out on top together, they were interrupted by Lacey Evans in a gorgeous black ensemble that was very vintage and cute. Then Lacey came out and basically said that she planned on breaking Sasha's jaw with the woman's right. And then she got interrupted by Naomi in beautiful Hello Yellow and the natural was so gorgeous. And Naomi said that she planned on snatching Sasha Banks' wig and becoming a three-time SmackDown Women's Champion. Then Bailey stated that this is that the, that this isn't going to be a night when everyone interrupts each other, and she gets interrupted by Tamina, who said that actions speak louder than words. And then she headbutted Naomi and then kicked Lacey Evans. And then Sasha and Bailey attacked Naomi and then realized that Tamina was still there. And then they schmoozed their way out of the ring by, while basically also kissing Tamina's butt. And it was just pretty funny. And then also there was the women's match between Asuka and Alexa Bliss. And Nikki Cross was on commentary. And, it's, and the match started with the headlock and then Asuka took advantage and danced at Nikki and Alexa and, a very, and then a very hilarious bit happened where Asuka was speaking Japanese at Alexa and Alexa kept responding as if she understood what she was saying before kicking her off of the apron. And Nikki was rooting so hard for Alexa at commentary to the point where it was freaking Michael Cole out like bruh like what is going on. And um, Alexa hit a whole lot of forearms on the apron with a kick, but then Asuka responded with a kick. Then Alexa responded with it by hitting an arm twist on Asuka and then hit with a near fall. And then Alexa Bliss hit a clothesline, but then tweaked her arm trying to hit another one of her signature moves. And then there were two near falls before Alexa Bliss hit the DDT for the win. And also, in probably one of the most promising segments I had ever seen in women's um, wrestling history in the segment between Mandy Rose and Dolph Ziggler Dolph was backstage talking to uh, I believe Sonya Deville um, about the Mandy dating situation with Otis or whatever and Mandy pulled him to the side and said that um, that she felt like Dolph Ziggler was going too far when he rubbed the pictures of their date you know in Otis's face two weeks ago to the point where he was crying and everything and he conceded and realized, you know, that he was wrong and said that it wouldn't happen again. And then Mandy took agency over herself and said that she um, was not going to allow Dolph Ziggler and Otis to treat her like a prize to be won in the match. And it was so incredible to see because there have been so many situations where a woman has been in the middle um, of a match between two men who were trying to win her affection as if, you know, she's an object or a trophy. And that's, you know, ultimately sexist because, you know, a woman is going to be with you because she chooses to be with you, not because you do something and then you win her like she's a trophy. Like, yeah, like, no, it doesn't go like that. Um, so there have been so many situations in WWE, like, say, for instance, at WrestleMania 20, Chris Jericho and Christian both fought for the affection of Trish Stratus that way. And then you also had the really messy real life situation between Edge and Matt Hardy over Lita. 
And then you also had Eve Torres um, in the middle of John Cena and Zack Ryder. So it was just a lot <laughs> to, you know, sort of see, you know, these women sort of be put in the middle of these things and make it seem like these male superstars are just going to fight over these women and they're and that's all that they're there for and i appreciated the fact that in 2020 we have a woman who's saying you're not going to fight over me like i'm some type of trophy to be won like you know and i'm like she is going to choose who she's going to be with and in time who knows it could be dolph it could be otis you mean i mean but at least she'll be able to have the choice and I am really grateful for that segment and how that went the way it went. So um, that's pretty much it on the women's side of SmackDown. Now, on the men's side, the first men's match we had was between Drew Gulak and Shinsuke Nakamura. And Drew Gulak had Daniel Bryan in his corner. And of course, Shinsuke had Cesaro and the Intercontinental Champion Sami Zayn um, on his side. But Sami Zayn was on commentary. Um, Drew Gulak started the match by hitting major stomps on Shinsuke Nakamura after Shinsuke started with an offense. Then Shinsuke got taken out of the ring, but then um, he proceeded to beat on Drew Gulak with Sammy and Cesaro, which was kind of unfair, but that's their, you know, MO. And um, then there was a headlock that Shinsuke had Drew Gulak in, but then Gulak kept punching back to break it. And then when Shinsuke tried to hit the Kinshasa on Drew Gulak, Daniel Bryan moved Drew out of the way and then Drew hit a cover to win the match. And in this match, Drew was fighting for Daniel Bryan's right to fight Sami Zayn for the Intercontinental Championship at WrestleMania. So since Drew won, Daniel Bryan gets his match. So that was pretty cool. And then between Dolph Ziggler and Otis, you know, they got into a backstage after Dolph Ziggler continued to diss him. And then he challenged him to, he, Dolph Ziggler challenged Otis to a match at WrestleMania with Mandy Rose in his corner. So that's going to still be a thing. And Elias um, was singing a song on the top perch of the Performance Center. And he called King Corbin a turd. And then he basically made some references to tissue with him or whatever. Because, you know, that's one of the funny things that we're making fun of in this crisis. Um, but then Baron Corbin snuck behind him and knocked him off of the perch with his scepter. And then Elias needed medical attention. And then also, there was a promo with the Usos who said that it would not be the road to WrestleMania without them having to fight the New Day, and which basically speaks to their storied rivalry, which was one of the best tag team rivalries of the past, of the modern era. But they did not say welcome to the Uso Penitentiary, which disappointed me because I love it when they say that. And then they showed a replay of the Triple H versus Roman Reigns match um, for the WWE Championship um, at WrestleMania in Dallas, Texas in 2016. And they did that, of course, to beef up Roman Reigns um, fighting Goldberg for the Universal title. And I'm going to talk about a couple of things that I liked about watching that match over again. And it was the fact that Stephanie McMahon introduced Triple H like he was a rock star and she looked amazing and brought all the drama to her monologue. And... I feel like we don't give her enough credit because I feel like as much crap as we give the McMahons, you know, for their decision making, you can't sit here and say that they've never entertained you at some point. And I feel like Stephanie is just one of the coolest characters on the planet, even though she's mostly evil most of the time. She's just really cool. So she's just a drama queen and I'm partial to women named Stephanie because duh. So, um, <laughs> and I'll always love her. And then what I also noticed was how poignant it is that during this match they boo they were booing the crap out of Roman Reigns you know not knowing what his struggles were it's like back then it was common knowledge that WWE really believed in Roman Reigns to the point to where it felt like they were shoehorning him in every big title opportunity at every pay-per-view and nobody liked that like they booed the crap out of him when he won the Royal Rumble that time and the Rock actually lifted his hand and they thought that was supposed to make it better and it didn't like it's just it just the wrestling community as a whole just kind of crapped on Roman Reigns after the shield broke up and they were just we don't want him to be on top because we see what you're doing you're shoehorning him in everything and we don't want this to the point to where almost in almost every match he wrestled in to a certain degree before he announced his leukemia diagnosis he was always just booed and vilified in everything he did and I find it funny that now the tables have just 100% turned because 
once this man announced that he had leukemia after he finally won the universal title because he never gave it he never lost it he just had to give it up it's just he's never truly been full-on booed since then and ever since he came back and announced he was in remission he's never truly been fully booed since then either so I just find it amazing that with the information we have about him now as Joe he you know was wrestling and still giving us a good show night in and night out without without us ever truly knowing that he was struggling with a debilitating disease behind the scenes and I will always admire him for that like he still tried even when we abused him a lot and yeah like it's just amazing how he was able to push through all of that and still do what he came there to do and it's amazing that he still pushes through even now so yeah so after they showed that match um they interviewed triple h and michael cole asked you know triple h you know who does he have his money on in terms of the universal championship match and triple h mentioned that since he's been in the ring with both of them he said that goldberg and roman reigns have one thing in common and that's intensity but they both have different levels of it he said that goldberg's intensity is all at once um but then he also said that Roman's intensity builds up over time, which can serve you better in a match because when you have intensity that builds up over time, that means you can go all the way as opposed to exploding all over the place in the beginning and burning out. So he's so he said that his money was definitely on Roman Reigns to win at WrestleMania. So that was interesting. And then the New Day had a promo and basically called the Usos little boys who have to get this whoop in. And then they were looking for their eighth um, tag team championship reign. And after that, we had Bray Wyatt's episode of the Firefly Funhouse. And he got into a weird one-sided argument with his Bray Wyatt head lantern that he carries out to the ring um, sometimes. And he said that he had his chance to beat John Cena and he failed. And he made a protein shake that was orange with ingredients such as disappointment and self-loathing and unnecessary opinions in the form of Rambling Rabbit, who he keeps sacrificing somehow. And it's just so sad. He just keeps sacrificing this little rabbit over and over again. (laughs) But he keeps resurrecting like a character from Sabrina. It's hilarious. But anyway... And then he challenged John Cena to a Firefly Funhouse match at WrestleMania. So basically, this match isn't just going to be a straightforward, you know, plain Jane type of match. It's just, it, it might be something really silly, or it might be something really cool, or it might be something really bad. Who knows? Um, I feel weird because the last time Bray Wyatt had a match like this, I forgot what it was called, but he had a match with Randy Orton at his compound, and his compound wound up getting burned down. So (laughs) I don't know how that's going to go, but I have an open mind. So we're just going to go forward with it. And then the um, main event, which was the Usos versus the New Day, um, the Miz and Morrison and John Morrison came out to do commentary as the SmackDown Tag Team Champions. And the Usos and the New Day were fighting for the opportunity to fight Miz and Morrison for the SmackDown tag titles in WrestleMania. So the match was pretty good in terms of athleticism because they know each other so well. The Usos control the early part of the match by beating up on Big E, but then um, he made a hot tag to Kofi Kingston who hit multiple leaping clotheslines and then he fought off a single leg Boston Crab from one of the twins. And then after the New Day took advantage with a double team move, Jimmy Uso threw Kofi into the ring post But then Kofi recovered and delivered a trust fall onto the Usos outside of the ring. But then the fight proceeded to spill out to the outside of the ring. And then The Miz and John Morrison got involved. And then um, they basically beat up on the both of them and made the match a no contest. So because of that result, Michael Cole announced that WWE officials have made um, their SmackDown tag team title match at WrestleMania, a triple threat between the Usos and the New Day, and also made it a ladder match to much to their chagrin. So it's a lot of exciting stuff going on at WrestleMania this weekend. So that's the end of this week in wrestling. And now we're going to go, um, to my conclusion. (laughs) 
Okay, so um, I have some concluding thoughts about some things I didn't mention in the beginning or even just in the show, period. Um, There was something that kept coming up and kept bugging me throughout this week about WrestleMania and how def- how it's definitely going to be different now because it's going to be spread across two days this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, for at 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, 4 o'clock Pacific, 6 o'clock Central Standard Time if you live here in Birmingham and on the WWE Network. And we all know that it's going to be different this time because there's going to be no audience and it's going to be spread across different locations um, due to the crisis and everything. And something that's been brought up a lot um, in conversations um, online and also in real life is just how they how people just feel like, oh, well, I'm not going to watch it and the show is going to be trash because there's no audience or the weekly shows are going to be trash even between WWE and AEW because there's no audience. And across all of sports and across all of um wrestling as well everyone is having to make adjustments because of because they're taking people's health into consideration and there's been a lot of privilege complaining going on from people who are just so used to things being the way that it it was that whenever anything changed about it they got mad and I just want to make one thing very clear I just know from my perspective because I love wrestling so much and because I love WrestleMania so much because I love the grandeur of it the way that it brings together generations old and new together to you know wig out over this one thing that we loved and every well love and loved you know in the case of some casual fans it's just the fact that these wrestlers these men and women across all brands and across all promotions put their bodies on the line day in and day out to entertain us and this hasn't changed since this um, crisis has started. They have been putting on shows for uh, for the television audience for like the past couple of weeks and the shows have not faltered fully not once. Now, mind you, they do show a lot of older things, you know, that you may have already seen or you don't really care to look at anymore or whatever. But you can't sit here and deny the fact that these people have done everything that they possibly can to still give us something in the midst of everything getting canceled like people's jobs have been you know eliminated people's you know livelihoods have been taken away people have been laid off people aren't working like you have people who are sick and scared of what is going to happen to them you know you have people sitting around in fear and you have these wrestlers and you have these companies who are doing whatever it is that they possibly can to adjust to the situation and make us forget about everything that's going on by still going forth and putting on a show and strong and I just strongly feel that if everyone has their preference you can prefer to watch wrestling with the audience you prefer to watch wrestling without it. you have that right as a free human being but I just feel like if you're a true wrestling fan and if you say that you love the game that much the least you can do is still give it a chance and still go forth and watch it because if you truly love wrestling as much as you say you do you would still remain faithful to it and honestly if you don't appreciate what they're doing even in the midst of this trying time then maybe you don't appreciate wrestling when nothing when nothing bad is or nothing crazy is going on I feel like a lot of the time we tend to complain so much, but yet have yet to truly look at the good part of things or the positive part of things. We as wrestling fans tend to talk about and get so caught up in what we don't like that we don't take the time enough to appreciate what we do like and what we do love. And I urge you and I challenge you, anyone who's listening to this podcast, to try your level best to Find something that you love about wrestling as much as if you feel like you love it and just move forward and just have fun with WrestleMania because that's all it is. It's big, awesome fun. It's so much grandeur. You can enjoy the outfits. You can enjoy the jokes. You can enjoy the older people who come to the show. You can enjoy the newer people who put on new matches who are looking to prove themselves worthy of legendary status. There's so much to enjoy about it. So 
don't ruin it for yourself simply because there's it's a new thing going on we know that it's new um in a new manner we know that it being spread across two days and you know and it being in different you know places is kind of inconvenient and us not being able to be there is inconvenient for a lot of people who did buy tickets and everything but for the love of god if you love wrestling just please push forward push past all the negativity all the fear and all the craziness that's going on and just lose yourself and watch it now with that being said um thank you so much for listening to my show um i've gotten 95 plays so far across across all of the major places that you can listen to podcasts and that is a huge blessing and i thank you so much for listening to me you can um follow me on twitter at queen steph hardy you can follow me on instagram at queen steph hardy you can also follow this podcast instagram uh, um at hardy wrestling podcast and you can also um friend me on facebook at stephanie Lashawn hardy and um you can listen to the podcast on anchor on this anchor app you can also listen to it on iHeartRadio radio now you can listen to it on spotify apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, or wherever else you listen to podcasts i'm working on possibly getting it on youtube but we'll see but thank you so much for listening to me all this time if you have and next week is going to be huge because there's going to be a week long stuff a week long worth of stuff going on and then we have the biggest show of all time the show of case of the immortals wrestlemania so um I promise it'll be a little bit more lighthearted than this episode than the middle part of this episode was. So with that in mind, I hope you're having um, a fantastic a fantastic weekend and I hope you had a you're gonna have a fantastic week and just remember to stay safe and stay smart, but most of all, stay you. I'll catch you later. Bye.